All right, everybody, welcome back to Unashamed. We're going to talk about what, in my opinion, was the craziest day of the legislature that I've had um, yesterday, which was, what, the 13th of March? I think so, yeah. Holy crud. We saw all the crazy all at once, and we're going to break it down for you super quick. Um, it's about 1230 in the afternoon on Thursday, the 14th. Um, we have 30 minutes to go over these absolutely insane bills, so we'll do it pretty quick. Um Walter, tell me about the universal basic income bill that you heard and were pressing uh, the, the bill authors on yesterday. Yeah, that was on Tuesday in the Children and Families Committee. Uh, Representative Athena Hollins presented a bill that would provide, basically it expands upon existing pilot programs. So if there are certain geographically limited pilot programs in the, all the places you would expect uh, that provide opportunities for some sort of basic income, which is a fancy way of saying cash handout, no questions asked, yep. just for drawn breath, yep. just for existing. Um, and so what this bill does is it expands that statewide and enables municipalities, tribal governments, and nonprofits oh my gosh. to act as middlemen for no real apparent reason. I pressed Hollins on this of why are we doing it this way? Because um, you read the you read the text of the bill and it's it's absolute bonkers. Um, there's no requirement for any of the, first of all for the grantees, which is those municipalities, tribal governments, or, or nonprofits, and of course the nonprofit part is the really egregious. that's huge. Yeah, there's no requirement for any sort of legitimization of those nonprofits or following up on what they did, which we, we get a report down the road of them saying, yeah, sure, we did exactly what you wanted, just trust us. So for, um, for, for the listeners though, universal basic income is literally just handing a check to somebody. Just handing a check to And we're, we're giving that duty for those checks to be right. handed out to a nonprofit. Correct. That so, doesn't need any any oversight. Correct. No reporting. Yep. What are they doing with No limitations, money? no limitations on administrative costs. So, I mean, there's nothing in the bill to prevent a grantee, for instance, from getting a hundred or getting a million dollars, yep. taking 50% right off the top and paying it out to their staff and calling it administrative costs yep. and then doling out the other 500,000 uh, to whoever they want. Yeah, our billable hours are 170,000 an hour. Well, so therefore, that's, that's what we use to justify it's a total political. <laughs> it's a total political giveaway because yep. you're 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 going to grant it to your favored nonprofit groups. They in turn have total discretion over who they give the money to. Right. The the individual end user, the recipient, doesn't have to prove their identity or demonstrate who they are or even they don't provide even have to be a Minnesotan. They don't no or an American, it, dude. It explicitly targets people who aren't Minnesotans or Americans. That's insane. There's language insane. in the bill that says these funds should be directed towards, amongst other things, recent people who have moved here from other states or other countries. That's in the bill. So this, we can boil this down to a single word. That, that's communism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's communism. It's taking your money and giving it to somebody who literally is not even a citizen. Yeah. When was the last time that Mexico gave you a check, Walter? Has that been a while? Happen? Well, according to Katiza Watoon, because we talked about this in committee, according to her, Minnesota earns, I think she said, $5.8 billion off the backs of illegal immigrants. So we should probably send them back and not use the labor. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> well, I'm wondering where my share of this $5.8 billion is. Yeah. I haven't gotten my check. Right. I can tell you my household uh, budget has not been fattened off the labor of illegal immigrants. That's insane. And it's incentivizing more of it. And for those who didn't see the news reports, uh, I believe from December, they found a, a federal terrorist watch list member here in yeah. Minneapolis. Right. Living, living here for three years. Right. An illegal immigrant that they found after three years that's living amongst us. And they want more of this. Yep. And they want to pay them. Oh, great. So let's go on to the next, uh, next topic. We've heard a slew of gun bills in the public safety committee, all of which do nothing to stop gun violence. Um, they just add more onerous and restrictive um, measures on law-abiding gun owners. Yep. Um, and I brought this up in committee. They don't actually charge or prosecute gun violence. So what are they hoping to accomplish by uh, passing a bill that says, oh, we're now going to allow a, a city or a local unit of government 
to expressly ban guns from their premise, but maybe the neighboring jurisdiction has a completely different policy. Talk to me a little bit about how the, the hoop jumping issues that they're presenting are only for the sake of making it damn near illegal to be a gun owner. Well, Chair Kelly Muller expressed it explicitly on Tuesday um, when pressed by Lee Paul Novotny on the, the whether or not a good guy with a gun can stop a bad guy with a gun. She got triggered and indignant and said that we all watched as Ronald Reagan was shot surrounded by good guys with guns. And she followed it up by saying America has a gun problem. And she got as animated as I've seen her get. Outside of when she's gambling one of us down. Right, right. Um, Typically you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> After making a good point. Uh, but, but that lets the cat out of the bat. Yep. When we say that all of the, the confluence of all of these laws that they've been, uh, or these bills that they've been advancing and signing into law, is to create a legal environment where it becomes wholly impractical. And legally hazardous yep. to be a law-abiding gun owner. The impact of that is you can't be right. a law-abiding gun owner, and that is through the direct implication of what she said. Yep. The goal, right? Clearly, it's it, they want to get rid of guns. That's well, they what want to get rid saying. of gun ownership. They don't care about gun violence. Well, exactly. if they did, then they'd be addressing that. But we we brought bill after bill that would actually get to the root of the problem, which is. Um, adding to this gun violence epidemic that we have here in Minnesota, but they don't want to take the guns away from criminals. No, no, no. That, that's that's too mean. Well, they don't. We need to provide wraparound services for them. We just if if you lawfully own a gun, that's the issue. There's 435 million guns here in America. They can't snap their fingers and get rid of them. But what they can do is get rid of private ownership of them. This this is what I think is 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 the accurate summation of their worldview, whether they would attest to it or not. They don't view criminals like street criminals as human beings. They view them as animals who are incapable of making good decisions or rational decisions. Yes. So they can't be penalized for something that's inherent. You cannot hold them accountable for their actions because they can't help themselves because we have not served them properly. That's literally bigotry of no expectations. That's exactly right. And... Um, so when they, like for instance, with this Burnsville situation that we saw, and there's yep. breaking news on that yep. um, regarding the straw purchases that um, enabled. And for those that don't know, do you want to uh, highlight? What yeah, you- sure. So the the this guy, I don't recall his name off the top of my head, who um, slew three first responders in Burnsville uh, after a standoff in his home where he was endangering the lives of seven children. He's a garbage human being. They garbage human that. being. Yeah, with a record, should have been put away, wasn't. That's, right. That is the root problem and the root cause of this situation. Um, but in like forty within 48 hours of this happening, you had Governor Walls out there touting Jimmy Beckerfin's bill for safe storage. When it would not have stopped the issue. Wouldn't have done all. a damn thing. The what most political hack move I've ever seen. And then the, the news today is that uh, the feds are pressing charges for straw purchase against the baby mama um, who purchased these guns on his – because he was prohibited from having right. guns. Right. He was prohibited and from so, having guns. There's no recourse to make sure that he doesn't. Right. Um, so baby mama buys the guns for him. And now uh, as law, law enforcement and first responders are showing up to the scene of a uh, sexual assault. Yeah. Um, they don't know what they're going into. Right. And so the point being that obviously everything that he did and that his accomplice, the baby mama, did was yep. illegal. Right. They broke the law at every step in the process. Correct. And it still didn't prevent this tragedy from happening. And what's Governor Wall's solution? More uh-huh. laws. We need a gun safe for We that. need more laws. Well, we just need a gun safe. And I mean, so what it, what, it's not even the fact that we need more laws. It's even the fact that they brought up that law. Yes. It flies in the face of anything logical. A law that has nothing to do with right. what happened. It, nothing. Apparently, we wouldn't have three dead heroes right. if w- they only had a gun safe. But the, the, the point is, is that what they they view it as it's it's not the fault of the person who commits the crime. It's the, the gun. fault of the person who legally purchases firearms because they are perpetuating the gun culture. I see. And perpetuating the availability. Like, these are all the key words. Which is why Ellison's use. going after Fleet Farm. Yes. It's the same. It's the exact same. They, the, gun, when they talk about accessibility, gun accessibility, 
hear gun ownership. That's what right. they mean. That's right. what they're targeting. They're they targeting say gun, gun availability. The lawful gun ownership. Correct. Yeah. But they mean gun ownership. Yep. All right. So let's move on to the next one. Uh, physician assisted suicide. Um, culture death from the Democrats just keeps coming. Um, we heard this in committee. Uh, what are some of your major issues with the bill? I know I have highlighted a few of them. Um, proving coercion into forcing somebody to take a pill that kills you. Uh, you don't even need a witness there as you, as you take that medication. Um, so there's going to be a whole heck of a lot of unsolved coercion cases. And when we brought this up, um, it was scoffed off. Yeah. Well, we had multiple expert testifiers, people who work either as physicians, or we had this one guy who does a law practice that specializes in elder care um, and matters of estate planning and whatnot, who, who said his testimony was, when this bill is signed into law, it will be easier to kill yourself mm -hmm. under this law than it will be to execute a will, right? That's crazy. Like, it's, it is nuts. It's gonna be easier to end your life than to bequeath your family. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's insane. That's absolute Bat crap. We have to we have to talk about what's going on in Canada too, because it, the the slippery slope logical fallacy that Democrats love to bring up when when we make an assertion, oh that's that's a logical fallacy. Oh that's a slippery slope argument. Well look at Canada right now. What are they doing with uh, youth, literally sixteen years old? If you have a mental health condition or a mental health crisis, they're prescribing physician assisted suicide. Yeah. Right. Well, you're pretty sad. All right, we're not gonna we're not gonna give you services. We're not gonna give you the resources that you need. We're not gonna give you that help. Right. Just take a pill. Yeah, it'll all be over. Well, I mean, there's that. That's the thing is categorically, there is no difference between what they're prescribing and any given suicide. This right. was a point that Lee Paul Novak yep. made in his line of questioning that made them very uncomfortable and had uh, Representative Freiberg the offer author scrambling and rooting around in a seat and yep. had Chair Moeller running and cover for yeah, him defense. to get him out of it because. Novotny kept asking, "What if, if somebody is eligible for the state-approved method of suicide? Can they use a different method? And then they just turn around and shoot themselves yeah. or hang themselves. What is the difference? Right. How, how is the one method illegal and considered suicide? But the still, other one isn't. But the other one isn't. And they could not answer the question because there is no difference. Yep. Yep. Categorically, there is no difference. And, and the, the idea that they're putting forward here, that because I find out I have a finite amount of time left, and because there's suffering in my life, those two things together mean I can kill myself. That is true at literally every any moment of, of your, your life. life. Yes. Any point of your all life. All of us are on a time clock. Yes. We all have a finite amount of time left, and we are all, to one degree or another, suffering. Right. That's so rather than fixing our, our, our health care, rather than, rather than actually addressing these issues and doing it with compassion. Yes. Which I can understand. I mean, I've had Republicans reach out and say, oh, I think that this is a choice issue. This is this is my freedom. Look, this bill ain't your freedom. This bill is trying to promote the easy the easy way out. Well, it's it's not only so. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is an attack on the fundamental baseline moral principle that life is a standard of value. Yep. It is it is it is well, quite so, literally. So placing a higher value than life. It is taking the, the, the standard off of life and putting it on dignity yeah. or peace or, yeah. you know, whatever your, your choice. Choice. Your choice. Oh, choice, right. Yeah. And it's like, no, life is the standard of value. L quite literally, and it's funny because I've had this conversation with people online re recently in, as it relates to the abortion argument. They'll, they'll, they will think they're dropping the mic when they say something to the effect of, well, do you really think that uh, it, life trumps choice? And I, I, I go, well, yes, yeah. of course it does. Do, do you understand that that you just articulated what a right is? Yeah, that's what a right is. A right is your life, life trumping life. somebody else's choice. Yeah, all the time. Literally, every right you have yep. is trumping somebody else's choice to violate it. So now they're pro-choice after conception, and right. when you're thirty years old. And you just want to, you just want to kill yourself. Yeah, and, I mean and that, so, that's that's how far they've gone. It is just an extension of the abortion arguments that they that yes. they love to drumbeat, and it's taking it to literally any any part of your life. And that's when you Insane. talk about the, when you talk about the slippery slope. That is the crest. That is yep. the, that is the point at which it starts to go down. Once you 
delegitimize the inherent value of life and life is the standard of value, there is no limiting principle after Correct. that. Correct. That's why it keeps it's moving. It's not bound to truth. It's Correct. Bound to, yeah, it's completely subjective. All right, let's move on. Gender inclusion in education policy. Uh, so we're now going to state mandate that your kid be taught LGBTQIA2S+. Yes, it's, it's gained a couple extra characters. Yeah. Um, and this is another Finky bill. Um, let's dive into it. Yeah, well, I haven't looked at the text of the bill, but I mean, I can take a pretty good guess at what's in it. It's yep. basically mandating that I teach my son that he's that boys and girls aren't a real thing. Right. Gender is malleable. Yep. There's no such thing as gender. It's all a social construct. We're going to teach that to your eight-year-old, yep. who, by the way, can't read at grade level. Yeah, uh, and <laughs> it's, it's a prima facie violation of the First Amendment as far as I'm concerned. Oh, for sure. You, you cannot compel speech. Um, you cannot insist that I lie. Well, they, they, they took that out of the, the Human Rights Commission well, yes. last week and when they said that religious institutions who violate uh, gender identity yeah. uh, pretext, that they're, they're subject to civil lawsuit. Right. For believing that there are two genders, if you are a church in the state of Minnesota, you could be penalized for it. Yep. Absolutely. That's 100%. insane. So it's, it's, it's ultimately ratifying and confirming that there is a state, state religion yes. and it's whatever in the hell a, a couple politicians say it is. Right. Yeah. That's no, insane. That's, that's, that is exactly right. We're doing voodoo down here yep. at the state capitol. And this is, you guys, just to, to really hit this home, this is 24 hours worth of bills. Like this yes. is not, this is what they move every day. They're yeah. thinking every single day, how do I tear down the fabric of Western society? That's what they yeah. wake up to, to do. Um, next one, full-time legislature. Let's talk about how crazy this one is. So... This one's interesting to me. Um, I have no doubt. I haven't looked at this, the text of this bill either. I have no doubt that I will be against it in its current form based upon what I've heard about it. Constitutional amendment. Yeah. And it's, it's tied a, in with two other things. Yeah. It's a constitutional amendment. And, and the, I knowing long the way that I do, I'm sure that his intended effect is quite literally to have us here all the time. All the time. Like, like we just live in St. Paul. Right. We rule over you. We don't talk to yeah. constituents. We don't serve them. Right. We rule over them literally from a palace, a $730 million palace that they're building right outside my window. Yep. Um, and oh, it actually has an, an overpass. You can you can look down on all of those that you rule yes. over. Yes. This, a, is, a this is political elitism, and they're doing it in the open. It's time we believe them. They don't want us to interact with constituents. They don't want us in district talking to our community members understanding where they're at on different issues so we can take their values up here and vote on them accordingly. They want us to be here all the time thinking about how we can rule over people. And that's disgusting. That's not public service. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's, that's just the thing is I, what I dislike, I think, most about the way this is packaged is that it's the conflation of full time with year round. Right. I, think, I think the more accurate way to characterize this proposal is year-round legislative session. Right. Um, now, I would argue that we are already a full-time legislature. Yep, 100%. Because I know how much you're out there working in your district. I know how much I'm out there working in my right. district. And both of us travel outside of our district to talk to people all the time. Um, and, we're, and it is not a part-time job. Right. It's you know, a full-time job. It's a sure. full-time job. If you're doing it well, if you're actually representing your people, you got to talk to your people. You got to know what's going on. You got to study the issues. This is not a part-time job, and so that's the, I think the thing that disturbs me the most about it is that it's conflating the concept of full-time with the with the reality of what he's actually proposing, which is a in here writing laws all the time. Yes, and year uh, round. I believe session. it was Mark Twain. Uh, anytime that the legislature is in session, your freedom yeah. and life are are in danger. Right, we, because <laughs> to, to my pre, to my point. Um, if we're here all the time, we can't do that other essential part of the job. Certainly not as effectively, which is actually talking to people. Yeah, yeah, touching grass. Yeah, usually exactly. It's, usually, it's it's it, the way that you should write laws is recognize that there's an issue or a problem or yes. something that needs to be changed. Right. Because you're you're literally not working with other human beings right. rather than just in this little political bubble in yes. Saint Paul. But instead, that's what they want to insulate us into. Think of Congress. Yeah. Think of how detached those guys get from the reality of what's going on in their right. districts. They don't even have to live in their district. And that's basically what they want us to do because Jim Joy, who's four and a half hours away, sorry, you're spending your entire year in St. Paul, not, yeah. up, not up in uh, Moorhead. Yeah. You're not talking to folks in that area. 
You're no, gonna, you're you stay you, here. You should be go to the grocery store in your district. You yes. should be going to the to the post office in your district, and and people should be walking up to you and telling you what the impact of the laws that are being passed in St. Paul. Good or bad. Alive. Yes. And I've had both at a, at a gas station, for example. I'm gassing up a car, and it's, hey, what about this bill? Right. And uh, they don't even they don't even address me first. It's just where where are you at on this bill? Like right. that's awesome. Yeah. That's that's transparency, and that's the way it's supposed to operate. Right. They want to insulate politicians from that. Yeah, and going back to your point about the building that they're going to be renovating here, uh, when when they're all said and done, it's going to be harder to actually physically access your legislature. Yep, there's no parking that it is now. Right. Yeah. There's literally no parking for you to come up here and talk to your legislator who's supposed to be representing your interests. Right. They don't want you in here. They don't. They don't care about your ideas. They don't care about your values. They're going to tell you what they think they know best. You got it. Next, um, this one's nuts. Waiving the mandatory minimum sentences uh, for violent crime. They're doing this based off of the predicate of a study. Um, everything that they want to affect that's completely radical, they frame it in the form of, oh, we're going to study this first by giving it to one of their nonprofit partners who's going to affirm what they think they already know. Right. And then they're going to do that crazy thing and say that the experts told us to do so. Yeah. That's what Cedric Frazier is doing with this bill. Mm-hmm. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's violent there's- criminals. No, no prison time. Yeah, there's not. That's not much else to it. I mean, he he uh, pulled me aside the other day and um, tried to argue that first of all that this doesn't eliminate mandatory minimums. Which, to your point, well, yeah, but that's what it's, the, it's aiming goal. towards, right? He's saying that. Um, and then the the other argument, <laughs> it's kind of the move the goalpost argument, right? Um, kind of similar to what we've seen in schools where. Uh, the overall performance of the students starts to trickle down, and so. But we're still above state average. Well, well, <laughs> what do you do to make yourself look good? You just change the grading standard. Oh right, so right. Eighty-five percent can be an A as yep. opposed to. And that's kind of what this is. Is they're saying, well, you know, the reason why we have, you know, you guys are always complaining about the these um, deviations or um, downward departures. Downward departures. There you go. Downward departures from the minimums. Well, there's reasons for that that have to do with this, that, and the other thing. And so, you know, what we want to do is we want to actually um, move the uh, the the minimum to actually match you what know, our what, intended goal is. What we're seeing. Zero. <laughs> yeah. So it's like so. In other words, they want to be able to score better regardless yeah. of poor performance. Right. So that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah. When there's 1,805 gun crimes in. Minnesota alone last year, which is a state record. Right. And 48% of them are not charged. Right. Or not convicted. Right. Then you're going to have more gun crime because yeah. you're incentivizing that behavior by not punishing it. Right. And now they, they literally want to do away with all punishment. So that 48%, uh, and now that becomes potentially 100 based off of the judge. You just mm-hmm. hope to God that the judge actually feels for the, the victim um, instead of the, the offender because... Every single Democrat appointed judge and all of these Democrat uh, prosecuting attorneys like Mary Moriarty, they have never met a cop that they like or a criminal that they that they don't love. Right. So it's, it's nuts. This is another nuts one. Uh, last one. Uh, legalizing sexual assault for LGBTQIA2S plus individuals. Let's talk about this bill because it is actually one of the craziest policies that I've ever seen written down. It's a nutty policy and i know we keep saying that but it's no less true each time we do i mean th- this i just read the text of this bill this is a quran bill on um, think he's House file 4657 look it up and what they're saying like on the face of it it's it's completely unnecessary right because assault is not legal. Like you, there, there you are can't no assault somebody. Right. right. There are no circumstances where not you that can, they prosecute it anyways. But well, yes. Right. But there are no circumstances where you can legally assault somebody. Um, and yet they have this bill that says that you cannot offer as a defense of a crime for a crime um, the facts, basically that you discovered that somebody was not the gender that you perceive them to be when you engage in the consensual act. Correct. So let's, let's, let's start this off with some context. Last year in Minneapolis, um, a man uh, had purchased, uh, solicited prostitution. And upon recognizing that the, uh, the person that he had, uh, wanted to pay payment for, for sex, when he recognized that it wasn't actually a female, 
pulled out a gun and, and shot this person. And that is what sparked this bill. So on the face of it, should that person have been shot? No. But should there be, um, sh should the person who's engaging in that act have to be under the presumption of this being consensual based off of your actual gender identity versus what you believe you are? I mean, you trick somebody into believing that you're a female and have sex with them and completely get away with it when they try to defend themselves and say, no, this is not consensual sex. This is a tough one to talk about just because it's so nutty. Like, consent, consent, the whole concept of consent um, implies willingness on both parties. Well, but it, all, it implies informed consent, yes, right? Like yes. that, that your perception is accurate and that you are not being deceived. Right. Um, fraud invalidates any claim of consent. Right. And that's really what I see is lying at the heart of this, is they're trying to, through the criminal law, to validate their claim of gender identity by saying, it's, by saying that it's so legitimate mm -hmm. that you can't even um, claim it as a fraudulent presentation in the context of intimacy. Right. That you must, you must recognize that that person is the gender to which they self-prescribe. I told Even though it's not biologically inherent. And that you can enter into that quote-unquote consensual act, recognize that it is not the same sex that you thought it was. Right. The same gender. And then your self-defense is completely limited. Right. You're, so w the way I see this bill, the way I read it, it intentionally or not effectively legalizes sexual assault rape mm -hmm. um, if the perpetrator is presenting themselves as a gender that does not match their biological sex correct so somebody somebody engages in what starts out as a consensual sexual activity and in the process of discovery um, realizes that their initial perception, was not correct, <clears throat> and so yeah. and so at in that moment, they their consent evaporates because they have been deceived. What limits somebody who's actually just raping somebody from using this as a defense? They, you, you make a fantastic point. You make a fantastic point. So if if in the commission of committing a sexual assault crime, somebody just changes their gender, yeah, they're immune from from any backlash criminally. Well, and according to these people, gender is fluid. So you could, yeah. just, you could decide Changes midway. Changes that way. You could decide midway um, that you, you flipped. And that right. I mean, it's, it, it's so two plus bad. Two two equals five. Yeah. It's so bad. But it's, it's at the point now where, uh, I mean, it's, it's been endangering Minnesotans and endangering children and endangering families for, since the beginning right. of this whole movement. But this takes it to a level that is just demonic. Yeah. I mean, the idea that we're going to provide a legal basis for people to get away with sexual assault um, by making some sort of convoluted gender identity claim is absolutely abhorrent. Right. And it, <sighs> Guys, that's one day in the legislature. Yeah. Holy crud. It's time to vote these, these people out. They should be nowhere near the levers of power. And we're just trying to restore some sanity. We're not trying to tell you how to live your lives. We're not trying to inflict... Uh, these quote unquote extreme Republican values on you that they always try to fear monger. We just want to return some normalcy because there is none up here right now. No. And yeah, I think that wraps it up, man. Holy crud. That was, that was a tough one to, to stomach. Yeah. I did not sleep really, really well last night having all this stuff go through my head, but uh, we'll keep you guys updated and hopefully we do this again here soon, but not with bad bells. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Cool. Thanks, man. Yep. I'm trying to get something to eat before my meeting. Good call. Here.